Welcome to episode 369 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger of SellingYourScreenplay.com. Today, I am interviewing Canadian writer Susie Maloney. She is a book author who was able to leverage that success into a screenwriting career. Again, she's from Canada, and she continues to live and work from there. She's very down-to-earth, offers a lot of great insight into the business of writing, how she got her start, and how she's been able to maintain a great career. So stay tuned for that interview. SYS's six-figure screenplay contest is open for submissions. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash contest. The early bird deadline is March 31st. After that, it goes up by $10. So if your script is ready, definitely submit early. This year, we have a short film script category, 30 pages or less. So if you have a low-budget short script, by all means, submit that as well. I've got a number of industry judges, producers who are looking for short scripts. The idea for the contest was simple, find the best low budget scripts and present them to the industry. We're looking for the best low budget screenplays and I'm defining low budget as less than 1 million US dollars, in other words, six figures or less. For shorts, I'm figuring, I'm thinking four figures or less, so well less than $10,000. Most of the producers who are looking for shorts, you know, the budgets on short films are very, very, very small as there's not really a good opportunity to make your money back with a short film. So again, for low budget short films, I definitely do have some producers looking for them. Um, however, they are going to need to be, you know, very, very simplistic and low budget. Every submission will get read by at least two professional readers who will do a short assessment, which you can actually purchase if you'd like. I've lined up about 50 industry judges to read the scripts that move into the later rounds. We're giving away thousands in cash and prizes to the winner. And once again, if this sounds like something you'd like to learn more about or perhaps enter, just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash contest. And if you're listening to this podcast after the contest closes, we're planning on running this contest every year. So do check out the landing page um, as I will publish the, um, the whatever dates are upcoming. I will publish them on that same page once the contest has closed. So again, sellingyourscreenplay.com slash contest contest. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking or sharing it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. Any websites or links that I mentioned in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast. And then just look for episode number 369. If you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address, and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell a screenplay in that guide. I'll teach you how to write a professional logline and query letter and how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Again, just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. So a couple quick words about what I am working on. We're still plugging away on the rideshare killer. A big thanks to Kurt Weiser, who did a number of effect shots for the film. Those are all finished. So now next week, I'm going to take those to the colorist for him to color. Kurt is also the producer of this podcast. So if you need some effects or podcast editing, please do drop me a line and I will put you in touch with Kurt. And we're just waiting now on sound design and final mix, which can't happen until the composer is done with the score, which is just about done. The score is basically done. Um, she has somebody that she works with to just kind of level things and mix things a little bit as far as the score goes. So they're working on that. I would say that's another week or two. And then um, we have sound design and then the ultimately the, the final sound mix. And then we're back to the editor and the editor basically puts all of these different pieces together, the sound, the colored version, um, and, and and then he will start to output those. And then we'll be basically officially done. And the other big news for, for The Rideshare Killer, the trailer is officially out. Um, and it was out a couple of weeks ago. So hopefully you've seen it by now. But if not, definitely check it out as well. I will link to um, The Rideshare Killer trailer in the show notes. So we're definitely getting closer. And I've been talking about this for ages now, but um, I'm putting together a screenwriting course, which will basically guide you through the entire process from coming up with to coming up with a marketable concept to actually completing the script and ultimately marketing the script. Um, so I'm gonna be releasing that hopefully in about a month. It's been a little harder than I expected to get it all together, but hopefully it'll be a nice course um, for folks if you need some help getting your script written. So those are the main things that I have been working on last week 
week. Now let's get into the main segment. Today I am interviewing Canadian screenwriter and book author Susie Maloney. Here is the interview. Welcome, Susie, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. Oh, thank you for having me, Ashley. So to start out, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up and how did you get interested in the entertainment business? Well, uh, you know, I was one of those out of nowhere people. I was born and raised in a little city called Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. It's uh, actually the geographical center of North America. There's a little fun fact. Uh, so hmm. being a little prairie city, there wasn't many examples of screenwriters or writers at all that I knew of. Our most famous writer was probably Margaret Lawrence, who's famous to us, probably not famous to Americans. And uh, I knew from a young age that I was going to be a writer. My grandfather wrote, uh, he wrote uh, crossword puzzles, so I kind of had an example uh, but I went right away into books. I started writing novels. My career was uh, as a horror novelist, and that goes pretty far back, farther back than I'd like to talk about. So that's where I came into it. Okay, so let's just talk about that for a little bit. Um, how did you get into novels? How did you get some of those first novels published? You just start writing them on spec, submit to publishers. Just in, in two or three minutes, maybe we can talk about that. I know there's a lot of screenwriters out there that probably have novels that they might want to dust off or even potentially write. Well, it's fun to write a novel. I don't blame them. I'm writing one right now. <laughs> um, well, right? I, you know, my stories started getting longer. That's what I keep telling people. I always wrote stories, and they just started getting longer and longer, and I started to think maybe I was a novelist. So my story's a wee bit unusual, <laughs> to say the least. I had written a book on spec, of course, just to see if I could do it. And uh, then I met the man who would be one of my husbands. And we moved to Ontario. So I had no work when I went to Ontario. And I thought, well, I'll spend my time writing another book and I'll look for an agent. So I used my first book, which I felt wasn't very good, to find an agent. I actually found the first agent I approached. And she sold my book within a few months. And that's the beginning of my career, not even kidding. And then after that first hmm. book came out, which came out, you know, to some acclaim, um, I started writing my second novel and it went into a bidding war on, after three chapters. It, it leaked and it eventually I signed for seven figures. I, it was the um, highest selling, highest advance ever for a novel in Canada. The film rights were sold to uh, Cruz Wagner, that's Tom Cruise's production company, um, and after a bidding war with a bunch of other companies like Demi Moore's and Jennifer Aniston at the time. And so, yeah, it was a weird, weird, it was a long time ago, but it was kind of this mm -hmm. weird jump start to everything. Yeah. And then how did you transition then into screenwriting? Um, did you, were you able to write some of these as you're optioning your books? Were you able to write some of those adaptations into screenplays? Um, talk about that transition going from a novelist to a screenwriter. Yeah. The last thing anybody wants is a novelist to write their screenplay. <laughs> they, they just know it'll end up a 425 page uh, screenplay. So uh -huh. um, no, I didn't. That is not actually how I got my start. I did eventually, after I, I wrote my third novel, it was called The Dwelling, and there were lots of eyes on it for, for film rights, and I had decided that after a, a lifelong affair with uh, horror film and television, I wanted to try my hand, and, you know, cocky little girl that I was, I figured if I uh, leveraged the right against letting me write the first draft, I'd be able to do this, and they see that, oh, look at that writer. <laughs> but what really <laughs> happened was the leveraging worked. <laughs> the leverage worked. So I, a smaller company ended up optioning the screenplay and uh, under the condition that I write the first draft. So there I was, my arrogant little self. I sat my butt in the chair, and I went, this is going to be a cakewalk because I have the blueprint right in front of me. And it's my own story, and... This is going to be so easy, and that quickly descended into tears. And, uh, yeah, one of the hardest things I've ever done. So that was my inauspicious beginning. <laughs> and I can tell you what happened. What happened to yeah, that? Yeah, please, yeah, continue the story. This is fascinating. <laughs> what happened was, um, obviously, I wrote a clunker. 
And I knew it was a clunker. It was no secret to anyone around me, you know, after multiple breakdowns, et cetera. Um, and uh, so the company that had hired me to do the first draft, they asked me very gently and delicately if they could hire, if they could allow the director that they'd attached to do the second draft. And so I had a new condition. <laughs> and my new condition was if he'll let me look over his shoulder so I can see how he writes the screenplay. And that was Robert Cuffley, who is the director of Bright Hill Road, my first feature film, which is the film that we're going to talk about in a little bit. So Robert and I met, and he let me shadow him while he did the rewrite. And I learned a heck of a lot about screenwriting and storytelling. And that was it. I never really looked back. I still wrote books after that. I wrote two more. But I started writing screenplays. And you know what they say, the outliers uh, rule is you need 10,000 hours of something to become, to be able to call yourself a craftsman. And so I, between that first time and now, I put in about my 10,000 hours. Isn't that cool? Sort of interesting that that works. <laughs> So perfect. So now let's um, let's get into Bright Hill Road and sort of talk about that. Did that start out as a novel that then you adapted, um, or was that straight to screenplay? Straight to screenplay. That was never a novel. It was never even a novel idea. Um, what happened was, and I think that this is probably how most people kind of stumble into their first opportunity. Robert, who mm-hmm. you know continued to be a sort of mentor, Robert Cuffley, the director continued to be through those years a sort of mentor and um, a good friend, frankly. And, you know, we were always kind of looking for something and talking about, oh, we're going to do this together. We actually did a short film together, uh, also not based on anything of mine uh, other than a fascination with digital assistance. And it was fantastic. It was shot on an iPhone. We had a lot of fun. And it's actually picked up a lot of awards since we did that. But having... Hmm. Someone having seen that approached Robert and said, do you have a horror film? We want to do never mind production, never mind films, uh, Colin Sheldon, the producer of Bright Hill Road. And Robert turned to me and he said, do you have anything? And I gave the only answer that you can give when someone says to you, do you have anything? I said, yes, but it was a lie. <laughs> that was a lie, Ashley. I had nothing. <laughs> so they wanted a treatment in a month. And so I had a sort of um, I had a sort of character that was floating around in my head that I'd always wanted to put into something. And so I took her and I took my fascination and terror of aftermath and I put them together and I had a sort of story. And then as I started writing the treatment, it became very exciting to me, the, the, the concept that I was playing with. And before I knew it, I actually did have something. And that eventually became Bright Hill Road. Huh, nice. So let's start out with a quick logline or pitch. Maybe you can just tell us what this film is all about, just the story. In the aftermath of a workplace shooting, a young woman flees only to find herself at a rundown boarding house where she's forced to confront her demons. I think that's it. <laughs> Log lines are the worst. I'd like all the screenwriters out there to give me a high five. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. So, and I will, I will link to the trailer too. The the trailer is really well done as well. So people can definitely check out the trailer if they kind of want to learn a little bit about the film. So let's just talk about your relationship with Robert Cuffley. I think that's fascinating how you guys met. He sort of mentored you. Um, maybe you can compare that. It sounds like this was a really good working relationship and. What, what was what is some of the things that you say are really good about it? And I ask this sort of in the context is at this point, there must have been some directors you've worked with that maybe the relationship was not quite as good. Um, and so for all the directors out there, you know, what can they do to facilitate a good relationship with the screenwriter that they're working with? I'll tell you the biggest thing, because some of it, uh, you know, is also just about, um, I you know, I, I hate to bring it into this, but. Sometimes as a woman, your voice isn't as heard in, you know, groups of men and, and filmmaking can be quite a male world. And so I think I went into that world, um, even a post meeting Robert with a bit of trepidation. Um, and the one thing that I can say, Robert always heard my idea. He heard it. Hmm. He thought about it. Often he used it. 
he is a great one to say, you know what, that's a good idea, let's do that. It gives you so much confidence as a storyteller. Because let me tell you, as you mentioned at the beginning of our relationship where he was mentoring, he was mentoring someone who took, you know, 540 words to say something that could probably be said in 35. And, you know, teaching them how to not do that. Um, and that was, that was the biggest problem I remember with that first draft of my own book was these long, fascinating, flowery descriptions, you know, that nobody could ever possibly shoot. And, you know, he kind of, uh, he, he moved me away from all of that quite effectively. Now I'm writing a new book and I, I find myself, you know, using very sparse language, but that's okay because it really works for Ira Levin. Yeah. So where are you located now? Are you, have you, are you in the United States? I'm in Alberta, uh, Alberta, Canada, um, in Edmonton, way, way up north. Um, yeah, at the, you know, past the, where am I? I'm almost north of 60. I'm curious, as your career has, has moved along, have you thought about making the transition down to Los Angeles? And if not, why not? Well, you know, I have access to Los Angeles um, through my agent. Um, I've also had, because I... I did live in New York for quite some time, and I also, my, my uh, literary agent is American, and they have uh, uh, their agency for film, book to film is, I, I believe it's still ICM. And so I have a lot of access to the U.S. Uh, you know, that's a, that's a difficult question to ask a Canadian today of all days, just because yesterday was the storming of your capital, which was terrifying yeah, and, yeah obviously uh, so, it's know, not the data no yeah. is the short answer <laughs> but of course i love la i've been there a lot of times and um you know if it was a tv gig i bet i'd do it but for film i can i can get as much done from up and i i'm a canadian you know <laughs> perfect perfect so let's talk about your writing process for just a minute um and we can be sort of specific with bright hill road um where do you typically write do you have a home office do you go to starbucks and when do you typically write are you a morning person a middle of the night person what does your sort of writing day look like oh, i'm a i'm a definite uh write every day person i can tell you that um okay. it's not always a mm-hmm. single project until you know towards the end when all those balls are rolling towards each other at the bottom there. I, uh, then I'm writing all day long. But I, you know what? I get up at 6.45. Hate me all you want, morning haters. I get up at 6.45. I do some yoga. I make coffee, and then I write until I have to walk the dog, and then I write again. Um, with Bright Hill Road, I had a very, very tight timeline, and so I skipped the yoga, never skipped the coffee, of course, but I, <laughs> I wrote all day long because I had about a month to write that after the treatment. Of course, treatment's the harder part. Once you have a treatment, you know, the joke is it's all typing. It's not exactly true, but I did have a treatment to work from, and so I was able to make my deadline. And then, of course, I got another opportunity to do a couple of passes on it. I don't recommend that, and normally that would not be the process. The process would be, you know, a, a nice, slow, thoughtful ride through the first vomit draft, and then, you mm-hmm. know, an even more thoughtful pass on a second draft. I burn a scented candle while I write. Oh, Very huh. important. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, just get you in the mood. Talk, you, it sounds like for um, Bright Hill, Hill Road, you're under kind of a deadline. You wrote this treatment in about a month. But what is your normal when you're working on a screenplay? What does it normally look like for you in terms of outlining? How much time do you spend on the outline, the index cards, the, you know, the treatment versus actually in final draft writing script dialogue and you know, action description and stuff? Well, I had, again, this is another tight turnaround. But in the past, when I've had my leisure, for instance, um, I don't do index, index cards because I come from the world of books. And so all of my outlining is done prose style in, uh, word, for, in, in word. So uh, I outline, I think, for, you know, you know how you've got one idea and, and it's at a more infancy than the next idea, which is maybe a toddler, than the next idea, which is just starting school sort of thing. And so you're always kind of working on a number of ideas. And so I start with the baby stuff, you know, I'll be jotting ideas down in the notebook. That I'll do that at least a month, um, if I, it's at my leisure, that said. Um, and then, you know, I'm, I'm a get-to-it kind of person, and so I'll spend two days where I will take that treatment and turn it into a script. 
fixing the treatment as I go and as I discover things, writing the screenplay. I wrote a romantic comedy in about what I think is my comfort zone, and it was five months. Nobody was looking for it. Nobody was rushing me. I was writing it only morning, and it took about five months from ideas gotcha. to completion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I'm curious, you mentioned that you're always working on multiple projects. Um, obviously, you've got a lot going on being a novelist and a screenwriter. So I kind of get that. But um, I worry a little bit about people that are always working on new projects, but never actually finish a project. And how do you stay, you know, because it's always the finishing that is you get the most resistance and oftentimes becomes the most difficult. How do you and if you keep having these other sort of other projects coming along, how do you stay focused? And how do you actually deliver and get those scripts over the finish line? Ashley, in all honesty, I only write one thing at a time. I mean, I have, I, I'm writing, uh, I'm writing a book right now, but I call that my side gig. And so I'm, I'm writing that at my leisure just for me, you know, for shits yeah. and giggles. Um, but I'm working on a screenplay that, you know, is my main project. The, what gotcha, I meant gotcha. by I've always got a multiple, I'm, I'm always thinking about multiple projects. And mm -hmm. so I'm thinking about, oh, I could write that if I wanted. And then that's in the back of my head, sitting there percolating, fermenting, whatever you want to call it, um, aging sweetly in the bottle like a good Bordeaux. And mm -hmm. eventually I will get to that idea and I'll start writing down bits more about it until it's time to say to somebody, my agent, what do you think of this idea? I think it's really going to work. And, and by then, you know, I've got kind of a premise and a, and a midpoint and an ending. And I, 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 mm -hmm. I kind of know what the story is. Um, but at that point, I, I'm not going to pick it up unless I'm done what I was working on. The other thing is, is I, you get a lot of first drafts. And then you've got to send it out to story editors or producers. Or, and, and, you know, and they give you notes. I'd like it more if it had this. And so then, you know, I don't consider doing a path. Uh, writing, I consider it a pass, and uh, you know, unless it's a page one rewrite, which often happens, mm -hmm. I don't consider. I think of it as a late stage kind of fixing up. So when I when we talk about multiple projects, it's really only one project being written at a time, one main project. So let's talk a little bit about the development, your development process, um, and we can talk specifically about Bright Hill Road. How did that go? So you you wrote this treatment. Were you in contact with Robert the whole time? Were you getting notes? And one question I always kind of like to just get a, 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 just sort of the the idea from the writers. Um, how do you arbitrate ideas, especially in a situation like this where Robert is maybe more experienced in film? Are there ever ideas that he gives you that maybe you don't agree with or notes that you don't agree with? And how do you work through those and still make maintain a good relationship with producers and directors that you're working with? Well, you know, there's, a, there's always a certain amount of tears <laughs> on both sides. That's what's up. Robert does have more experience than I do. Um, lucky for me, and maybe for him too, we have very similar tastes in horror, in what we consider to be horror, what we consider to be um, good storytelling. We have similar tastes. And maybe that was right from the start when, you know, he thought my book great movie and so did I. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But so uh, when I was writing the treatment, I was in contact with Robert, but we have an agreement where he lets me have my head, so to speak. You know, I, I he trusts my storytelling. I mean, I've, I've sold a lot of books. And so he trusts that I know how to tell a story. So it's usually when I've cornered myself I'm really stuck, or if I'm confused as to whether or not something is cinematic, which is less the case now. I'm writing currently my, so I've, I've learned an awful lot like writing those other ones. So then I'll call him and we'll discuss it. And he always says to me, do you want me to read it now or do you want to save it? And I can make that choice, you know, and if it's terribly troublesome, I'll say, yeah, I want you to read it now. But in the case of Bright Hill Road, we were under the gun and... Mm -hmm. So I wrote the treatment straight through, and then everybody read it, frankly. Robert read it first. He's always my, you know, a gatekeeper. Um, you got to get a director that's going to get your, have your back, right? And uh, so then once, you know, anything glaring was fixed, it went to the producers, the executive producers, and, the, and my agents, and, and, you know, Robert's manager, and, and our cabal of people that, are all on side with whatever it is is being made. 
Um, mm-hmm. So that so that was that early process, and then by the time it was time to write the script, as I mentioned, the treatment was pretty solid, and so uh, writing was smooth. And Robert was in pre-production. I didn't have the opportunity for a lot of support until things were falling into place. And then, you know, he read the draft and he made notes. I went and fixed what I could. And then it went back to him and then it went to everybody. And we shot on schedule. So I do, one thing I can say about myself, you know, having been a novelist, I do write fast and I'm a very quick study. So I get it. And it's easy when, because we do have excellent communication I know what he means, and he certainly knows what I mean. Um, mm-hmm. He's kind of like my interpreter. So if somebody else doesn't get something, he, he knows how to make it something that they will get. What sort of notes did you get from the um, the production company that you guys were working and submitted this treatment to? Um, I'm equally lucky there in this in the case of Brighthill Road. Um, Colin Sheldon, the producer, likes horror. Uh, he's produced a lot of films, and so he doesn't give you know, the sitcom version note, he gives really good notes. I think an early one was, uh, you know, related to, we're not sure we can shoot this in this sequence. You know, can you move around the times of day for these scenes so that, you know, we had a small budget and locations are always one of those things that, you know, bleed into how things are shot and, you know, creatively can we, can we make the scene easier to shoot? Mm-hmm. I learned a lot with that too. I learned a lot about uh, using locations and financially. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It sounds like those are yeah, sort of financial notes. Yeah. yeah, I wish I had some bad stories to tell. I'm trying to think of any. But this is actually a really maybe it maybe it was because everybody had to be on absolute best behavior because we had a limited shooting time and you know, most budgets now are are small ish. And so everybody, you know, did their best. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, what have you seen? I like to wrap up the interviews just by asking the guests um, something that they've seen lately. Um, HBO, Netflix, Hulu, anything that's out there um, that you think would be especially interesting to screenwriters? Well, I saw the other night, The Lodge. That's a 2020 film. Riley Keough is in it. I forget the name of the filmmaker and the screenwriter. Isn't that terrible? Um, it was fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. I am permanently damaged by that film. Is that right? Okay, I'll check it out. That sounds like a good recommendation. How can people see Bright Hill Road? Do you know what the release schedule is going to be like for that? I do. It is released North America VOD January 12th, 2021. Perfect, perfect. And what's the best way for people to keep up with what you're doing? Um, Twitter, Facebook, a blog, anything you're comfortable sharing, I will put in the show notes so people can find you. Oh, friend me on Facebook, follow me on uh, Twitter and Instagram. I'm Susie Maloney okay. everywhere. That's S-U-S-I-E-M-O-L-O-N-E-Y. Okay, perfect, perfect. Well, Susie, I really appreciate you coming on the show and talking with me today. Good luck with this film and good luck with all your future films as well. Ashley, thank you so much. I love the podcast. Hey, thank you. I really do appreciate that. So good luck, Susie, and um, we'll chat soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye. A quick plug for the SYS Screenwriting Analysis Service. It's a really economical way to get a high quality professional evaluation on your screenplay. When you buy our three pack, you get evaluations at just $67 per script for feature films and just $55 for teleplays. All the readers have professional experience reading for studios, production companies, contests, and agencies. You can read a short bio on each reader on our website, and you can pick the reader who you think is the best fit for your script. Turnaround time is usually just a few days, but rarely more than a week. The readers will evaluate your script on six key factors, concept, character, structure, marketability, tone, and overall craft, which includes formatting, spelling, and grammar. Every script will get a grade of pass, consider, or recommend, which should help you roughly understand where your script might rank if you were to submit it to a production company or agency. We can provide an analysis on features or television scripts. We also do proofreading without any analysis. We will also look at a treatment or outline and give you the same analysis on it. So if you're looking to vet some of your project ideas, this is a great way to do it. 
We will also write your logline and synopsis for you. You can add this logline and synopsis writing service to an analysis, or you can simply purchase this service as a standalone product. As a bonus, if your screenplay gets a recommend or a consider from one of our readers, you get to list the screenplay in the SYS Select database, which is a database for producers to find screenplays and a big part of our SYS Select program. Producers are in the database searching for material on a daily basis, so it's another great way to get your material in front of them. As a further bonus, if your script gets a recommend from one of our readers, your screenplay will get included in our monthly Best of newsletter. Each month we send out a newsletter that highlights the best screenplays that have come through our script analysis service. This is a monthly newsletter that goes out to our list of over 400 producers who are actively looking for material. So again, this is another great way to get your material out there. So if you want a professional evaluation of your screenplay at a very reasonable price, check out www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. Again, that's sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. On the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing Steve Kostowski. He is also a Canadian writer. He got his start doing special effects makeup and special effects creatures up in Canada, and he has now moved into writing and directing his own feature films. So keep an eye out for that episode next week. That's our show. Thank you for listening.